So stage one of the Tour de France today, which is an opening time trial, 16 kilometers long, uh, sorry, 12 kilometers long, which finished with Yves Lampert winning ahead of Wout van Aert, Pogacar, Ganna, Van der Poel. Bit of a surprise win, to be honest, Um, but we're going to go through some of people's bikes. But first of all, we're just going to go through some numbers because there are some pretty interesting um, numbers. So here we have Van der Poel's power data. Um, this is basically the segment, uh, more or less, 50.4 kilometers an hour, which correlates a little bit slower than this but obviously that it includes the start as well um where he's going a little bit slower um so anyway yeah 12 36 max power which is straight off the gate which is pretty aggressive to be honest like that is not insignificant um off the gate and like maybe for him not too much but you can see this first part he definitely really whacked it pretty hard to get up to speed 717 watts for 18 seconds uh, but I guess it makes sense. It was a technical course. You can see that there are a number of times where he couldn't pedal. Um, and it was also a course where you need to take some risk on the corners. I'm not going to lie. Uh, Strava, Strava, what's it called? Strava Source reckons this is only a Cat 2 profile. This one is apparently only Cat 1. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, 435 normalized for 15 minutes. It's pretty impressive uh, considering how much, how technical it was. Um, so we can look here sort of on the straight parts doing about 500, which is what you'd expect really from these guys. 500 on the ons. 450 a little bit longer here um and then you know less watts around the corner obviously but i think all in all it goes to show that this course is actually pretty technical not too much can be gleaned from the power data realistically i think lampert probably gained a lot of time in the corners um you can see there's like significant slowing down in the corners obviously like this one here hit down to like sub 30 like 30k an hour obviously at lampert's could probably take that a little bit quicker because it started to dry off so i think that probably had a part to play with it. Obviously, the watts, you can't can't deny. He had to go 50, over 50k an hour. But I think that's definitely a, a, an aspect of this. Maybe there was some wind. I think wind in a city, though, I'm a bit more sceptical about. It's not like it was an open TT where you can just go and do whatever. Like, you know, the wind's really going to blow across the field. In a city, I'm sceptical that the wind is going to have a big uh, effect. And I think in reality, maybe going later, it could have been more beneficial for GC contenders than going early, considering the better weather. But they all went at the same time, all of them except the stage winner, so more or less they had the same conditions. But anyway, that's enough from just the numbers. I don't really think it's it's like that exciting. Like, you know what they can do. It's an open day TT, 430 watts for 15 minutes. It's like decent, but it's nothing absolutely thermonuclear. What we're going to get up now, which is a bit more exciting, is uh, some of the positions, the, t the uh, helmets and the rest. So first of all, we want to go to Adam Yates' bike. Now, this is um, Ineos's bike, uh, which is their new Pinarello Bolide, um, which is pretty exciting because it shows them, sorry, my internet seems to have gone, and anyway, we'll go, oh, for fuck's sake. we'll go over to Bisca's uh, bike first before I get my internet back. Um, so anyway, Bisca's bike, again, not too different in a lot of ways, but the big difference really is the chain rings. And I think pros have only just realized um, the importance of having a massive chain ring because I was doing the, the calculations for myself and was like, if I'm gonna ride like 44 to 46k an hour on my time trial bike, which is like not that quick, because I'm not very good at time trialing, well, I'm not that good at riding a bike full stop, but especially time trials, then um, I want a 58 for ideal chain line, that would whack me in about the 14 to 16, which I was like, mm, that sounds pretty good for the chain line. And then you see like people like Gano, for instance, were in that, and I was like, how does that make sense? Because to be honest, Gano should be on a lot bigger chain ring, uh, than someone like myself, because obviously, you know, his TTs are closer to like 58k an hour, maybe even bigger. Uh, like, you know, I guess when they're pedaling, it's closer to 60k an hour on some of the real short TTs. So I think in that sense, it makes more, it makes way more sense for pros to have bigger chain rings. So if we actually look at Biscus here, he has a 64 tooth, which I think could be a bit of an overkill, but it is quite funny because it just looks stupidly large. He's also got a one by, which shows that he's paying attention. And he's also got a chain cover. Now, I think this is a big difference between pros and amateurs. So and as an amateur myself, I don't mind if I'm going to drop my chain. Number one, it never happens. I've never dropped a, a one by chain uh, in training or racing. I have for my hill climb bike and my time trial bike. I never dropped it. But I think with pros, they're just like, why would you do it? Like, if you drop it in the Tour de France, that is your get, like, time trial game over. So like, why would you risk it? It's probably only a watt or two. So it doesn't really make any sense. Anyway, tires, course of speeds, love to see it. Fastest TT tires around. I think the STRs are pretty close. Ceramic speed, oversized pulley wheel, probably does nothing. Um, and then handlebar setup, hopefully I'll show a little bit more. Um, the, yeah, the article says nothing important. But yeah, some Vision custom bars. He's supposed to have a super low CDA. 
It's a decent bike, the Cannondale, nothing special, looks pretty standard error. If you look here, like there's not much, the seat stays okay, yeah, they're dropped, but they're not like crazy, crazy dropped, just a little bit. Um, but yeah, and I assume he's probably has a wax chain, otherwise he is a donkey. Anyway, I've got my internet back, so we can go have a look at Adam Yates as well as um, Mark Soler's bike. Now, this is Soler. He basically came last on the stage, took it real chill, but I think, again, it's interesting to see the Colnago bike in the flesh. He's got super high stack. I think that's like some of the highest stack I've ever seen. This front wheel is something that's really interesting as well. It's super, super deep, like 100 mil um, or 90, I think it might be. Um, it seems incredibly deep in comparison to what people were running back in the day. I think everyone knows based on Aero Coach, I'm just trying to see if it says here, um, that actually it's really important um, to have a deep front, uh, deep front wheel and that a tri-spoke probably isn't enough. Um, no one seems to know what the front wheel is. Um, the rest of it is just like pretty clean, integrated bar and stem, 3D printed, etc., etc. You wouldn't expect anything else from the guys. <laughs> Terrible tires, but you know, it is what it is on inner tubes as well. So that's some rolling resistance loss. He's not on a one by, I'm pretty sure Poggy would have been on a one by, probably a 58 or something. <laughs> they seem to really enjoy the one bys as well, which is always good. I think Mikael Bjerg is a big part of that. Um, and yeah, except from that, that's pretty much it. I'm going to see if there's any more photos bef uh, after we go through Adam Yates because I couldn't seem to find too many, mainly because I've done this straight after the stage. But this bike, I think, is one of the most attractive bikes I've seen and most interesting bikes. So it's a new Pinarello Bolita. You can see here that the tire is super, super close to the rim, which is quite classic. It's also really close here and not far apart, which some bikes have done. Same with the rear as well. Now we've got GP5000 STRs, which everyone seems to think is very very fast if you listen to um alex dowsett's vlog with uh dan dan bigham he was saying how it's quite funny that now the strs are basically the fastest tires around he's got some nice integrated bars and stems and he's got a big one bite so we'll get into some new photos and nicer photos more in-depth photos later so you can see this is a really interesting princeton carbon works wheel now it's a tri-spoke which i guess is not that interesting it looks similar to uh, revolver tri-spoke but the interesting thing is the wave pattern i've never seen a wave pattern on the outside with the tri-spoke but also a wave pattern on the tri-spoke itself like that is really weird and i guess i think most people seem to say it's just because um it really helps with stability and it looks pretty deep i'd say like that's probably like an, a 70 mil maybe i don't think it's quite 80 it could be 60 but it's, it's, a, it's definitely like deeper than you'd expect Sometimes it's maybe only like 40 mils for tri-spokes, which I think is a bit soft. And people need to go up and realize that having a deep front section rim is rapid. GP5000 STR, standard. I like this integrated bar and stem. It's the Ghana style. Before he was going just for a standard round bars and stuff. I assume that's just because it's easier to modify when they're testing for less important races. You can see it integrates pretty nicely here. Um, I believe it'll probably have uh, some M6 bolts coming up from the bottom. Uh, then we've got the water bottle very far down as well. And then... This is the most exciting thing is one by again, uh, it's a uh, aero coach, I believe, based on the pattern 60 tooth, which again makes sense. You can also see like a nice detail here is they've got the aero chain ring mount bolts. Um, so they go over the bolts and it just make it a little bit more clean. I'd also like to see them maybe obviously a power meter is here, but around here just have it. So it's actually not um, got any holes in it because apparently when things are rotating, that makes it even bigger if you can cover it up. Why do they have 170 mil? I think you should go 165, personal opinion. 165 feels a lot nicer. He's about the same height as me, and I don't know why he's not on that, but maybe just tradition. Um, but it's interesting that he runs a front derailleur. Again, why would he run a front derailleur when you can't um, have an inner ring? And they seem to say he's running an inner ring here, but I'm pretty sure he's not because you would be able to see it uh, through there. And also, if you actually look at this teeth pattern, you can see it's a narrow wide teeth pattern as well. So he wouldn't actually be able to shift anyway. So um, yeah, actually we can look here. Oh no, sorry, he is run running an inner ring. So I don't really know why he's running an inner ring. Again, that makes no sense. Why would you do that? It's beyond me. Uh, they should probably take it off. Um, but anyway, it is what it is. I think people just don't wanna um, have that chain come off. This is very neat. Look how, look how small that, that uh, valve is. I've never seen anything like it before. Like that must be a custom valve extender or something. Again, not tubeless though, interesting. I thought it probably would be. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it is tubeless because you'd expect to see the valve here unless it's an interesting thing. Direct mount hanger, that is a classic. Um, we've also got Ganna's bike, which is pretty similar. Obviously his extensions are different. It's got some World Champs bands here and there um, and some nice stickers, but that is basically it. Just go back and see if there's any more pictures. So here's Eve Lampert, who again is on 
not the stupid helmet, which we're going to get onto in a minute because the helmets were interesting. Um, but I think we should have some images here. You can see he's like not running a hundred mil front rim. Weird. He's not running the new helmet. So I think he just had a really good day. I don't think his equipment was necessarily that much better. I think it was probably just like he was on an outrageous day and could maybe corner better because it wasn't as dry. Um, so yeah, that's that's my verdict. If you look at this sort of setup here, it's definitely not as optimized as some other people's setup. So he either had big watts or took big risk in the corner and probably a combination of both. Um, but yeah, we can see some of these, some of the pictures from the worst riders, but there's no real point looking at them like, Yombo Bisma setup is a standard Cervelo setup. There's nothing really too interesting. This is um Biscuzzi with the POC helmet. Again, decent Van der Poel, standard 100 mil aero coach, etc. etc. You know, I, I don't think there's too much to go through. What I'm now gonna go through, which I think is more interesting, is what we're seeing now is helmets. So this is on uh time trial positions, which is one of my favorite um groups on the internet there's always some absolute wrong ones on it and they always seem to sort you out with some good photos so anyway what they're talking about here is the oversized helmets now it's something that has really had a bit of a trend since the pop temper where people want to have quite a wide helmet to try and put the airflow over the back now you can't see ganner in this position as well that it doesn't make as much sense but the point is is this sort of goggle thing seems to push the air around the shoulders i think and this is completely different to ethan hater who's got the sort of a it is a guess similar helmet but it's slightly different and I think this is the weirdest thing is actually, as I said, Lampert didn't use it, but the weird helmet sock thing that makes no sense. Well, I don't really get it. Apparently it's to keep your hair in or something. I thought it was so that you could pivot the helmet so it'd be more aero. Because if you ever tried on a TT helmet, often the best position is when it's like pivoted backwards on your head a little bit, but that can be hard to do. So I thought maybe that was it. Apparently it's not. Um, but yeah, if we're just going to go through the helmets now, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah interesting to see the development but hopefully we can get a picture of um of the Ineos riders in it because I think that would be super interesting to see uh well just to show you like why I think it's different FDJ always have a good setup as well bottom Balcom Olima. so you can see this weird helmet situation with Vlasov I don't think it looks good Bardet there's oh my boy oh, so that's G but he's not I don't seem to have many pictures of people in the extensions it's really annoying actually uh, I don't think we're going to get any pictures of the Ineos guys, unfortunately. Um, but alas, it basically, all it shows is that it's similar to the Pop Temple. Um, and yeah, slightly different helmet position. So anyway, cheers for watching. Hope you enjoy this video. If you've got any more things you want me to go through on the time trial, I'm very happy to. Uh, basically, for the rest of the tour, I'm going to be making a lot of videos. Um, and just, you know, all the rest of it. And uh, one last thing I forgot was Ganner's wearing the weird underlayer. So he can get some dimples involved. So you can see under his skin suit, he's wearing a, a vest basically um like a base there which allows the dimples to come through because you're no longer allowed to put them on so instead they have underneath and the skin suit so tight it creates the dimples but anyway that's all from me hope you did enjoy this video make sure to like and subscribe and all the rest and i'll see you in the next one